everybody, this is, this is Brian Bartley, and you're going to get to hear his story uh, here as we, as we talk a little bit. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Absolutely. And um, uh, Brian is used to giving his testimony. Uh, he's got a pretty unique one, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. So I wanted to start off first uh, just by asking you a little bit about uh, where you grew up and how you grew up. So for anyone who cannot figure it out, no, I was not born in Idaho. I thought the <laughs> accent would give it away a little bit. Um, I've been told that I sound like I have an Australian accent. I wish. Um, it is New York. It is a combination of New York and Boston. It is terrible. I know. Um, I was born and raised in New York, lived on Long Island most of my life. Uh, went to college outside, uh, well, in Pennsylvania, up in the northwest corner of Pennsylvania for a couple of years. Went to live outside of Boston for about four years and then came back to New York in 2001 because genius me decided to join the NYPD and spend 20 years with them. So I moved back to New York in June of 2001 and entered the police academy in July 2nd, 2001. Yeah. So uh, some of you are, are already doing the math uh, that, uh, that he was instated as a New York police officer July of 2001. And uh, those of you who uh, remember this far back, uh, but uh, 2001 was a big year for New York City, specifically in September. And so um, uh, we, we talked uh, a little bit. Um, we we kind of discussed your testimony a little bit on the phone in, in prep for this. And uh, we had been referring to um, September 11th 2001 as a New York City police officer actually is the second craziest day of your life. So tell us a little bit about that day. What happened on that day for you? So that day being a month and a half into what should have been a six month academy training. Uh, typically I was doing a day tour that day which meant I had to be in Manhattan at about seven o'clock in the morning which means I was on a 515 train out of Deer Park where I lived uh, into Manhattan. Normally, you carry a bag that's got, I don't know, 50 pounds worth of gear and books and all kinds of nonsense with you. And one of the rules in the academy is you couldn't have your cell phone. We all carried our phones. We just left them turned off in the bag. As I was walking from my car to the platform to get on the train, I realized I didn't have my phone on me. Started to go back to the car. Train came in. And I went, eh, one day without the cell phone. What could possibly happen? I have kicked myself every day for 22 plus years for that comment in my mind. Mm -hmm. uh, went, got on the train, got into the city, uneventful, got into the academy, going about our day. And Manhattan, for anyone who doesn't know, it's a no-fly zone. Commercial planes are not allowed anywhere near Manhattan for obvious reasons. While we're sitting in class, we hear what sounds like a plane. And one of the guys sitting near the window actually looks out and goes, it's an airplane. We all just kind of looked at him and went, really, detective? <laughs> this kid's going places. <laughs> Scarier thing is he did become a detective. Holy girl. Um, a short time later, a lieutenant comes into our room and says, listen, a plane just hit the World Trade Center. We don't know what's going on. You guys are going to be put on standby. <laughs> We're going, okay, a plane hit the World Trade Center. We're talking to Cessna, right? Little prop job, pilot hour or whatever. No big deal. A uh, little while later, he comes back in. Second plane just hit. Okay, this is something a little different now. Now the thought is, okay, there's actually something going on. Because none of us actually thought about that commercial airliner that had just come over the building 10, 15 minutes earlier. We're thinking, you know, this can't be something. We're brought down into the auditorium. Now that we're a class of about 1,500 at this point. Complete rookies. We have no. We have nothing. We're in a gray academy t academy button down shirt. We don't have firearms, shields, bulletproof vest. Nothing. You guys are gonna be put on stand by. Stand by. We're gonna mobilize you. Okay. Um, they asked, "Does anyone here have family that works at the trade center?" My father worked at Six World Trade Center, which is the customs house. He worked for U.S. Customs at that point in time. Um, had no idea where my dad was. My older brother was actually a police officer with New York City at that point, uh, a couple of years ahead of me, and was supposed to be doing a day tour that day. Had no idea where he was. 
we're allowed to make phone calls. So I'm brought up to the fifth floor. I go, oh, let me grab my cell phone out of my right. <laughs> About an hour that way, no phone. So I can remember two phone numbers at this point. I can remember my parents' house. Well, they're both at work. That's going to do me no good. And I can remember my brother's cell phone. So I call him and write the voicemail. Great. Hey, listen, I'm at the academy. I heard what's going on. We're being mobilized. Do me a favor. I don't have my phone. Call the academy. Let me know if you know what the heck's going on, where anyone is. Um, don't know when I'll talk to you. I found out at about 5.30 or 6 o'clock that day my dad was actually in Connecticut at a meeting that had been scheduled a month before and had been canceled, thankfully. And my brother was actually sitting in traffic on the Brooklyn Queens Expressway trying to get to work as everything went down. So both of them were safe, but definitely a uh, nerve-wracking long day. I think we were released finally at about 10.30 that night to go home and had a report back for, I think it was 6 a.m. the next day. I think we were doing 6 to 6. So we were supposed to be doing 12-hour tours. Typically in the police department, a 12-hour tour turns into a 14, 16, 18-hour day. Um, without the commute in and out, so a long day, to say the least. Goodness. What did, what did the weeks kind of leading on from that look like for you as somebody who's still in the academy? At, you know, what, what kind of things were you mobilized towards? So we were mobilized out that first day on the 11th. We were actually, I was actually put out with a bunch of other guys in front of one of the hospitals uh, about a mile or so from the academy. And where the academy is located at this point, we're about five and a half miles from the Trade Center. So we're told, you're going to keep First Avenue open. You're going to, this way, traffic keeps moving. This way, ambulances coming from the World Trade Center can get to the hospital. Okay, no problem. Thousands of cars coming up the block. Thousands of people walking up the block, just covered in dirt, dust, debris, everything. And maybe one ambulance. After that, we were slowly brought down towards the Trade Center site where we would do site security. Uh, basically making sure that nobody who was not a first responder, a steel worker, or somebody who had a legitimate reason to be at the site was there. We would also escort people into their homes or their businesses in the area so that they can remove personal belongings because nobody knew how long we were going to be there. We spent about a month mobilized in that area. Wow. Um, well, there's some other things that we want to talk about, but before I move on, I just, I think I can say on behalf of everybody here, everybody who will watch this online or watch this testimony someday, um, thank you. Thank you for uh, enlisting as a police officer. Thank you for uh, your service on that day. And thanks for being willing to go back and walk through a day. I'm sure it's not fun uh, some of the memories that even talking about it brings up. And so we really appreciate you uh, going there for us today. So can we thank Brian? So that was the second craziest day of your life. Um, and um, it's quite a day to have the second craziest day of your life. Um, Tell us a little bit about the craziest day of your life. So, I think I just did, but 9-11 um, <laughs> is definitely your ranks up there. Um, the day that you're referring to, I count as probably my biggest blessing in my life. Um, 19 years after 9-11, I was just not in a good place mentally. Um, you're talking PTSD, depression, you name it, it was there. My head was not in a good place at all. My head was just, I wasn't living right. I wasn't living for the Lord. I was living for myself and for the world. And it took a lot. And my wife finally looked at me and said, you are a mess. You need to get yourself together. You need to get right with God. You need to figure this out because you're in a bad place. And she was 100% right. Um, I was not in any kind of way, shape, or form what a person should be, what a husband should be, what a father should be. Um, it took me a long time to figure out where I was. Um, I've dealt with PTSD for, what, 22-plus years now. So 
I've dealt with that for a very long time. I was in counseling at that time, reached out to the guy that I had been talking to for a couple of years at that point, couldn't get a hold of him. Guy wouldn't return a phone call. I'm like, oh, nothing like being in crisis and your counselor just disappears. Gee, thanks, buddy. Um, reached out to a couple of friends of mine, one guy who was a year ahead of me on the job, so he was at 9-11 in a way more involved manner than I was. Spoke to him for a while. Um, wound up actually reaching out through the NYPD to a chaplain who was a, uh, who's a priest and had a conversation with him and nothing really clicked with him. It just it wasn't, I thought, because he was a guy who was in the police department that there would be some kind of connection, something would make sense. It didn't make sense. Um, actually reached out to Pastor Dave at that point um, had a conversation with him and started some counseling with him and December 28th of 2020 over Zoom because I'm still in New York at this point Pastor Dave actually led me to Christ and I was saved and the second that I accepted Christ sitting in my basement with tears streaming down my face there was just this overwhelming sense of calm and peace that came over me and just changed my life, changed my entire world. That's awesome. That's crazy. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that um, really stands out to me about your story um, is that God is long-suffering. <laughs> that God's, God's in this for the long play. Right? 19 years. Yeah. 19 years uh, with this uh, trauma in your heart, in your mind. Um, and the Lord is uh, probably, probably chasing you in ways you still don't know. Oh, uh, absolutely. Dur during all that time. Absolutely. There, there's so many things that I can look back on now and go, yeah, God was chasing you the whole time, and you were just, your head was so buried in yourself and in, in nonsense mm -hmm. that you couldn't see any of it. Yeah. So, But the thing that's crazy is that one day he was able to open your eyes to what was going on. Yes. And that's 100%. It was God coming after me and saying, hey, you need to wake up. And I couldn't see it. The person who saw it was my wife who said, you are a disaster right now. You, you, what are you doing? And I was like, I don't know. What am I doing? I couldn't see it. She yeah. saw it. And God used her to say, hey, dummy, wake up. It's time. And luckily and thankfully, she got the message through. So Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Katie, for speaking up. Um, what, an, what an awesome what an awesome thing. I, I think it's, it's important to note, you get asked a lot uh, to tell your story, maybe from a public service mm -hmm. uh, standpoint, uh, from a uh, patriotic standpoint. Um, but the other thing that just stands out to me is that God is willing to use absolutely anything to draw us to him, including 9-11. Right, so so uh, here here's a guy who, if the Lord had not led him into that valley, through all of that difficulty, um, it, you may you may never you may never have had your eyes opened uh, to the ways that you were falling short, uh, to the ways that you needed Him, and uh, that's why it's a little bit tongue in cheek, right? Say the second craziest day and the craziest day, but by far the greatest miracle here is not that you survived 9/11. It's that you were a sinner who had your eyes open to your need for Jesus yes. and received him. Yeah, 100%. I mean, uh, looking back on 9-11, yeah, it, it obviously it brings up a lot of painful memories. It brings up a lot of trauma. Um, I have been, like I said, I've struggled with PTSD, depression for 22-plus years. Um, the only person who has suffered with it more than me is my wife. Um, who's the only one who's been with me through that entire thing, who, who's dealt with it from, I mean, you met a very broken man in 2002, and 
somehow managed to stick with me. So mm. thank you for that. But yeah, it was looking back on 9-11, looking back on everything that I've gone through since 9-11 that led me to Jesus. I wouldn't be here if I didn't have her saying mm. they had, if God didn't use her to say, hey, yeah. you're broken. You need help. The only way you're getting that is getting yourself right with God, getting your head straight. Mm-hmm. Without that kick, I wouldn't be here. I can honestly say it. Uh, yeah. I was in a, in a real bad place that now looking yeah. back, it, you know, I used to describe to a therapist for years I felt like I was in a really dark tunnel, and the only light that I saw was a freight train coming at me. Yeah. After finding Christ, after being led to Christ by Pastor Dave, that light wasn't a freight train anymore. Mm-hmm. It was just God. It was light. It was awesome. And I'm in a place now where if you had asked me five years ago, talk about 9-11. Nope, not happening. Never going to happen. Yeah. Two and a half years ago, we moved out here, and I was asked to speak about 9-11. And in the back of my mind, I'm going, no, not happening. And as the person's asking me if I'm willing to do it, I hear myself going, yeah, absolutely, I'll talk about it. (laughs) What did you just do? (laughs) It took a little while, but I figured out that was God saying, hey, you need to talk about this and open up and bring this out, and that's one of the ways that I deal with it, is through God and through his mercy and his grace that I am able to talk about it. And me talking about it makes it easier for me, but it also, I've had the opportunity to speak more times than I can count in the last couple of years to high school students and younger. And people who have no idea, all they know it from is a history book or something they're taught they've never heard it from somebody who was there. Yeah. So I think I bring a different perspective on it, but I bring a much different perspective on it in the last couple of years because of having Christ yeah. and being able to say, hey, you know what? That horrible day, that craziest day of my life, of most people's life, brought me to Christ. Yeah. And yeah, it took 19 years, but without the experience that I've had, I wouldn't have found Christ, so. That's so good. Whatever trauma or difficult thing you've walked through or are walking through, let this be a testament to you that God's in this for the long play. Maybe he's chasing you. Maybe he's trying to show you something. Um, And that he'll use anything to draw you to himself. Can you guys help me thank Brian for his testimony this morning? Thanks, Brian. You're good, you're good. You can leave it there. That's fine. That's fine.